How are you? Good. It's great to see everybody. I want to welcome everyone here. First, I want to welcome our students. If you're an FIU student, please raise your hand so we know you're All right. It's good to see you. I also want to welcome the faculty, our professional staff, alumni, and members of the community to the beautiful Biscayne Bay campus at Florida International University. My name is Brian Schreiner. I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the College of Architecture and the Arts at FIU, uh, the new home of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. And on behalf of our President, Dr. Rosenberg, and our Provost, Dr. Furton, I want to welcome you here this afternoon. This year we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Pulitzer Prize, which honors excellence in journalism and the arts. By hosting this distinguished panel of South Florida Pulitzer Prize winners. But before we begin, I would like to recognize a few individuals who made this afternoon possible. First, Willie Fernandez, would you please rise? <laughs> Willie, Willie is the managing editor of the Sun Sentinel, and it was Willie who originated this idea. I also want to recognize the executive director of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, Dr. Juliet Pinto. Dr. Pinto. And her executive assistant, Mira Langsam. Is Mira here? I know Mira's always working, so Mira's someplace doing something to get ready for the next event, I'm sure. Also, the SJMC staff, Phil Tucker, Josh Shear, Kristen Bird, and Wayne Clipper. Are you here? Thank you for all your work. And additionally, but not finally, will the faculty members of the School of Journalism, Mass Communication, Hearst Lecture Committee please stand and be recognized? Who was on the Hearst? Thank you. Thank you for organizing this very special event. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to my friend, Mr. Howard Saltz. Howard is the publisher and editor-in-chief of the Sun Sentinel. Uh, Howard will give us an overview of what the Pulitzer Prize is and help us contextualize the honor that these journalists and photographers have earned. Howard has worked for 25 years for Dean Singleton's Media News Group. In the 90s, he became the deputy managing editor of the Denver Post. And in 2006, he joined Media News Group's corporate staff as vice president for digital content. Before moving to the Sun Sentinel in 2010, in 2013, Howard led the Sun Sentinel to its first Pulitzer Prize, the gold medal for public service. Additionally, Howard serves as chair of the Dean's Advisory Board for our very own School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Please join me in welcoming our friend, Mr. Howard Saltz. Brian, thank you. Um, it, you know, it's a pleasure to partner with uh, FIU. It's a pleasure to have an excuse to spend the afternoon here at the FIU campus. So um, it's good to be here. And also a pleasure to partner with our brethren at the Miami Herald, and they'll be uh, up here later. Uh, so as uh, Dean Schreiner mentioned, it's the centennial anniversary of the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and the administrators of the Pulitzer Prize up in uh, Columbia University in New York uh, asked that um, newspapers uh, around the country uh, ponder different kinds of events to celebrate uh, this uh, prestigious prize, and that's how this event came about. Um, for folks who don't know it, we are live streaming on the FIU website, the Miami Herald website, the Sun Sentinel website, and Media Shift. And uh, the Pulitzer Prize website uh, will post, uh, they're not live, but they'll post uh, a, a, a video of this uh, at some point in the future. So about the Pulitzer Prize. Um, I, I think it's a truism to state that it's the highest honor in journalism. I don't think there's, there'd be anybody who could viably dispute that. It recognizes excellence in journalism, in letters, in drama, and music. Um, and you know, for many of us today, and I'm, I'm quoting uh, uh, Rick Hirsch of the Miami Herald, whom you'll meet later, uh, Rick, Mo uh, Rick uh, noted in email exchanges uh, that it represents the highest standards of our profession um, in an era that um, has so much deception, distortion, lazy reporting. Uh, the Pulitzers stand out. They compel us to do better. Uh, and in, in many ways, they uh, elevate our profession. Um, and I'm going to add one other thing. It is hard 
to win a Pulitzer Prize. I mean, it is very hard to win a Pulitzer Prize. I know, um, well, we'll meet Pulitzer Prize winners today who have been, who, who finally won after many, many years in their careers. I know many journalists and excellent newspapers who have never won a Pulitzer Prize. It's very hard. Um, just to put it in perspective, um, comparing it to things like the Oscars and the Grammys and uh, Emmys and Tonys, things that we're more familiar with in the culture, from a strictly mathematical standpoint, it's easier to win one of those, right? So there's, you know, uh, there are 20 Pulitzer Prizes given out every year. Uh, eligible is uh, the voluminous uh, amount of um, uh, published content, and published is regardless of platform, uh, in, in the course of a year. And these, you know, thousands of articles, they'll 20 will be acknowledged, uh, or photographs, 20 will be acknowledged total. Uh, using the Oscars as a comparison, there's roughly the same number of Oscars given out, I think about 24, and Hollywood really only produces a few hundred films every year. Um, along the same lines of Grammys, Tonys, I don't even think there's 100 plays produced on Broadway in a given year. So um, it's hard to win a Pulitzer Prize. So um, having stated that, um, it's actually a, a great honor of mine to uh, introduce the uh, Pulitzer Prize winners uh, who will be on the panel today. Uh, so the way this will work is uh, first we'll uh, hear from Sally Keston and John Maines of the Sun Sentinel. They led the investigation in uh, 2012 of uh, speeding police officers and that landed the gold medal that uh, Dean Schreiner referenced before, the, the gold medal in 2013 for the work done in 2012. Um, we'll have then a uh, question and answer. And then uh, Rick Hirsch of the Herald will replace me here as moderator and will um, talk with Pat Farrell, the photographer, Jacqueline Charles, a reporter, uh, whose work led to the Pulitzer Prize for Breaking News Photography in 2009. That was for uh, uh, coverage of the devastating hurricanes in Haiti. So uh, let me call up Sally and John um, to, the, to the panel here. And uh, while they're coming up, I'll... Um, I'll give you a little bio. Um, in addition to the, uh, the 2013 uh, Pulitzer Prize Gold Medal that they're here to talk about, um, Sally was uh, a finalist in 2006 for the Pulitzer Prize for investigating, investigative reporting. That was for a series on, uh, on FEMA fraud. Uh, she's been with the Sun Sentinel as an investigative reporter for 17 years. She's a graduate of the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern. John Maines um, was, uh, also worked, he did the database analysis for the uh, 2006 Pulitzer finalist. Uh, he's been with the Sun Sentinel for 18 years uh, and previously worked as a reporter uh, for newspapers in Mississippi and New York. And we talk about John as a database, database analyst, but that's, with, we don't even say it, but as a journalist, he's not some uh, computer geek. John is, a, John is analyzing uh, data uh, for journalistic purposes. So um, let me start off by giving some background on the story that won the Pulitzer Prize gold medal in 2013. So um, it started with the notion, I, I guess, that um, there was a Miami uh, police officer who was pulled over by a Florida state trooper. We may remember this, because this made national headlines, because uh, it was videotaped. So uh, the, the state trooper pulls over this police officer, and he's driving 120 miles an hour. Kind of unusual for one uh, member of law enforcement to pull over another member of law enforcement. Uh, and that's why it made national uh, headlines. But it occurred to a lot of journalists, I mean a lot of people in general, that this is kind of common. Everybody kind of had the sense that Police officers were speeding in instances when they were not going to an emergency. Um, it it kind of it served as, a, as a sort of the, the, the springboard to, to kind of confirm what everybody knew. But of course, for the journalism students here, uh, that's not enough to, to write a story just because you think it's true. You got you to gotta report it. So um, from, from anecdotal evidence, uh, these reporters um, figured out that there would be a footprint, a digital footprint, left by police officers who are speeding, and those being uh, highway toll records, right? You have a, um, uh, 
a police car, which is equipped with a transponder to get, which would record the Sun Pass uh, records, and those are, well, as we learned, public documents because they're in police cars. So um, they use these public records, um, which never had been uh, never had been accessed before by the media. And here's what they found, and this was all in the story, but um, it's worth repeating. Uh, they found that it wasn't that that speeding by off-duty policemen, police officers, was not occasional. It was rampant. Uh, the speeds were were not. 80 miles, 90 miles over the limit. They were hitting 100, 120, 130 miles over the limit on a regular basis. And when police were caught and when they caused crashes, uh, they were rarely punished. So the data that they amassed and the reporting that they did resulted in a, uh, resulted in, um, a, a three day series of, st of uh, stories that looked at Sun Pass toll records from 12 police departments in South Florida. Um, Sally and John found uh, nearly 800 cops who reached speeds of 90 to 130 miles an hour in the previous year, many of them while they were off duty. The series was published in February of 2012. It uh, found that uh, officers driving at high speeds, often in non-emergency situations, had caused at least 320 crashes since 2004. I mean, that number, I'm, you know, I'm, I got my notes here to, to, to uh, remember these statistics. It still gives me chills. Um, those crashes, those uh, 320 plus crashes, uh, killed or maimed 21 people, um, including a 14-year-old girl uh, who was killed by a sheriff's deputy who was speeding to a routine traffic stop. It also includes a college student who was left brain damaged by a police officer going 104 miles an hour for no apparent reason. Um, and of all of these officers who were in act, who, were, who had caused accidents and were driving over the limit, only one was sent to jail and that person was sent to jail for 60 days. This is chilling. So um, before we get to John and Sally, and I, I, I know uh, you all are eager to hear them speak, I am, uh, let's, as part of our uh, online presentation, we did a uh, two-minute video that encapsulates the whole thing. Why don't we watch that, gives you a sense of the whole story, and then we'll get on to the panel. Can we run that? Um, can someone from FIU tell us how to close it? Escape. Okay. We expect police officers and deputies to come rushing during emergencies, but what about when there's no emergency? South Florida law enforcement officers are sworn to uphold traffic laws on our roadways, but they're among the worst speeding offenders the Sun Sentinel investigation has found. Oftentimes, the speeding ends with fatal results. This is a tragic accident. I know what I did was wrong. I know I was driving faster than the speed limit on that night. The Sun Sentinel has learned that more than 700 cops from a dozen agencies hit speeds of 90 to 130 miles an hour through South Florida highways from October of 2010 through November of 2011. Miami police officers were among the most chronic off-duty speeders with 143 cops driving at least 90 miles an hour, all of them outside city limits. More than 50 exceeded 100 miles an hour. When shown the records, even Miami police officials seem surprised by the numbers the Sun Sentinel uncovered. Can we get a copy of this? Cause this yeah, we, we, we will be reading it. Yeah, we thank you. Wait, all those arms? Yeah. Wow. That's not an improvement to the violent and very laws that we enforce. This is something that our entire uh, affairs uh, major to receive and, and investigate because, you know, again, the policy is what the policy is, and the policy says that they are, they are here to the laws, rules, and regulations, and the Department of Orders, and, and um, you know, any time we find that someone's not doing that, then we have to deal with the consequences that come with that. The problem with speeding cops caught national attention in October when a state trooper clocked Miami police officer Fausto Lopez 
going 120 miles an hour on Florida's turnpike on his way to a second job. Okay, that's the gist of it. Um, John, thank you. So, all right, this is the end result, right? This is what we uh, published online with the, uh, with the text and databases at the end. So let me roll it back, um, and I'll ask John and, uh, or Sally, Sally or John, um, how did it get started? The, the, the cop at the very end there is Fausto Lopez, and in this video uh, from the trooper's dashboard camera, was really just stunning. And uh, I mean, the guy was, this was pre-rush hours about, I think, 6 a.m. So there was a lot of traffic already. He was on the turnpike. He lived in Coconut Creek, and he had to get down to Coconut Grove. Um, and he was late for his off-duty job. And he's swerving, like, it, just weaving in and out of five lanes, going 120 miles an hour. And this trooper, you know, normally they don't pull anybody over, right? But she had seen this this Miami cop car just, you know, flying by her before, and she just had had enough. So she, she pulls in behind him, turns her lights on, and is trying to pull him over, and it takes seven minutes <laughs> before he finally pulls over. And, and then there's an exchange at the end that you see there, and she actually handcuffs him and throws him in the back of her patrol car. Uh, but then one of her bosses later said, no, no, uncuff him after, you know, high-level discussions and let him, let him go with the ticket. Uh, but that, you know, that incident was just, it, and it went, the video went viral and people on the, the Herald was writing about it and, you know, there were hundreds and hundreds of comments from people just outraged by this. I mean, think about the hypocrisy of uh, you know, police officers, this guy all day long is writing tickets, right? Writing speeding tickets. Um, and here he thinks, you know, he has a pass to go 120 miles an hour. Uh, so that just made us start thinking, you know, we had seen this, every, everybody, if you drive down here, um, although traffic's gotten so bad it's hard to speed, but, uh, you know, you see, you see cop cars and, you know, they'll fly by you on I-95 and, and they don't have their lights on and a lot of times they, they're not even in their jurisdiction, so you wonder, you know, well, what, what's going on? They're just speeding because they can. So then it just became, um, how you know? How can we document this? We gotta we gotta figure out how we can we can prove it. So ultimately, we ended up with SunPass, but we actually tried a few other things that didn't work out so well <laughs> first. And there's a, also yeah, a reason. Ahead. There's a how reason that the cops, when they're out of their city and driving home, out of their territory, don't turn on their their lights. You know, because that'd be the best way to do it. Just let everybody think you're in an emergency situation. But usually when you turn on your lights and your sirens uh, in your car, the, first of all, the webcam goes on. And, and in a lot of cases, it notifies dispatch that there's some kind of a problem. So it would have alerted their home base. Some of the early uh, attempts to do this were not successful. Uh, the radar gun. Yeah, the radar you know gun. Uh, nothing wrong with trying and failing. <laughs> we, we first asked, uh, we did a few belly flops. Um, the first was uh, we, we tried to get, we thought we could get transponder data or black box data. Black cars now have black boxes like airplanes do. And that, the police, uh, the police didn't want to give us any of that. Uh, and for the most part, we realized we'd have to go to each city and fight. And, and it turns out a lot of them didn't have a, a GPS or any kind of system of recording where the car was. And others said, if we give this to you where the car is, you know, we'll be re revealing where stakeouts are and all kinds of things we won't want. Cause, so there would have been a huge legal fight to get this stuff, even though it's probably public record. So at that point, we decide, okay, you know, radar guns, that's what cops use on us, let's use it on them. And, and so we, I went on to Amazon and we bought a little $120 Bushnell uh, radar gun, battery powered, and, uh, and Sally and I decided we figured that there was a good place we could go, an overpass, to look out and, uh, and see if the cops coming at us. Now, cops work often 12-hour shifts, and the shift starts at 6 in the morning. So Sally and I went out there about 4 or 5, and we dragged along our, uh, uh, the video photographer, uh, Joe Cavaretta. And we all walked up. We parked away from, uh, in, away from the overpass and walked about a quarter mile up. And we took our radar gun. 
and we pointed at the cars, and every, there's a lot of cars coming down 95, or the southbound 95, or they're going for Miami. And first of all, when you, you, you've got lights coming in, you can't tell who's a cop car. And second, you know, y y even if you did, you've got this radar gun, how are you gonna prove to anybody which car you actually hit? And third, when there's a wall of lights, headlights coming at you, what you can see is a wall of rain heading for you as well. <laughs> and so we were sitting there on the, on the overpass and uh, the rain was coming, Sally were in, and I were in our street clothes and of course, uh, we, as the rain came, Joe, our photographer, ready for anything, he puts on his Gore-Tex and he has a little Gore-Tex raincoat for his camera and we just got soaked. <laughs> that didn't work. All right, so GPS doesn't work. Right. <laughs> Good idea. So, you, so Sun Pass is the way to go, right? It's exact, can't dispute it, don't get wet in the rain. Um, so, you, so Sun Pass records are the way to go, you just asked, and they gave them to you, right? Mm, no. Oh. <laughs> uh, actually, we weren't even sure when we first started out on this uh, if cop cars even had Sun Pass, um, and, and then if they did, you know, how it worked. And, you know, we, we thought about, well, we could go to each of the police agencies and, and put public records requests in and say, you know, let's see your SunPass data. Um, and then we knew, you know, we'd get resistance on that. So we thought, well, if we can go to the state, the keepers of the SunPass data, um, and get the, you know, multiple agencies' data through them, then that would save us a huge step and maybe, you know, fights with each of these police agencies. So I called up and just asked for like a background interview to explain how it works and you know, hey, do, do cop cars even have SunPass? And the answer was some do, a lot of them do, some don't. Um, and you know, so how, is, how are the records kept? And they said, well, each police department has what we call a public account um, and they just list the transponder numbers that are uh, assigned to the transponders in all their cars because they're not charged for tolls. So that's how we keep track of it. Um, and we said, oh, you know, well, so those, those transponders, then you have the data for, you know, where they're going, which toll booth they go through, what time, and they said, yeah, that's what we'd have. So we put, a, we put a public records request in for, I think, 16 police agencies down here uh, and asked for all of their toll transactions for the previous year. Um, and SunPass, it's part of the Department of Transportation, and they said, well, first, we've never been asked for this. Um, and then second, forget it, it's not public. Um, so that was the first answer we got. And, you know, so we, as we typically do when we hear this from a state official, we say, well, you know, give us the, the exact part of the law that you think allows you to keep these records confidential. And the, the law they sent back through, this was just through email, was it, it's the law that protects your credit card information. So if you give SunPass your credit card, um, you know, to keep paying for your tolls, then, you know, that's, that's confidential. Well, fine, that's, that's what it should be, and we don't want that, and that's not what we're asking for. So we just argued back and said this doesn't apply. It's not the same thing. We're talking about toll data for public agency, public vehicles. Um, and, and they surprisingly said, okay, you're right, you can have the data. Okay. All right, so you got the data, that's it, right? No. Um, what do you do, uh, and, and this is really a question for, for John, uh, you've got, um, was it more than a million pieces of raw data? Right. It, you could show this too, would you? Or I'll, can I'll you? Uh, the raw data. Um, this is how it comes, and, and it, you look at it, and it looks a lot probably like your SunPass bill, except you notice there's no name, there's just a transponder number. We didn't have the names of the officers, the transponder in the car. Uh, that's uh, over there on the left. And then where they went through and the time that they went through. There's no, here's where they started, here's where they stopped, how fast they were going, uh, and, and the time, you know, all that had to be calculated by us. So you drove these distances? <clears throat> we started out, Sally and I uh, each, I think separately, uh, drove cars, our cars, uh, down, uh, down uh, through a couple of interchanges to see what we get for a reading. And, and the first thing we found that her car got one reading and mine got one, another one, which is maybe a tenth of a mile off. And so we were like, okay, why is that? Well, if you talk to a few people, they'll say, you know, look at your, your car, if, you, if your tires are worn, if you're, you're, you 
put on a different set of tires from when you the, what came in the car, it's not going to be consistent. And we had to be as exact as we possibly could. So, and also, we initially started when we were doing it, uh, we, we, we were just kind of driving it and thinking, okay, all we had to do was kind of look over to our left and see where the exit was, and no, and, and that's, that's where the mileage would be. No, we had to be much, much more accurate. So uh, I think Sally contacted Garmin, and they said, we got just the thing for you. It's the thing that runners use and uh, cyclists. And it was about the size of a, a matchbox and uh, small. And they said, this is a GPS, and it will give you extremely accurate readings, and it goes down to the hundredth of a mile. And uh, so we drove about 2,500 miles back and forth with our little toy, back and forth and recording mileage, and, and you had to drive the northbound route and the southbound route, because as you know, sometimes you get off in an exit and you're right at the street, other times you have to loop around. So it's all different. So there was a lot of driving involved. So how long did this take? And I'm asking that question for the benefit of the audience. At the time, I probably asked it differently. I probably said, well, how long is that going to take? You remember? I, I remember think, one day where I drove 600 miles in one day, back and forth, back and forth. That I remember. <laughs> I think we spent about six weeks on this. This was the labor-intensive part. And just to back up a little bit, you know, so if you see here, you can tell this car went through this one toll at 9.4701, and then the next place is at 9.4824, right? So in order to calculate the speed, you got to know how far it is in between. So that was the exercise. We thought, well, we'll just call the state, and the state will give us the distances between all the toll booths, and surprisingly, they don't have it. They didn't keep it. So that's why we had to go through this whole exercise of we had to determine how far it was between and there's, you know, there are dozens and dozens of toll booths, if you can imagine, all over. Miami is where we spent most of our time. Um, but, you know, the turnpike up and down Broward and into Palm Beach County. So it took about, I would say, uh, six weeks. Uh, it really went, was a two-person job because you had to, like, mark exactly the spot under the toll grantry as you passed it. And, and then, you know, again. and. It was hard to do for a driver, so we had a we had some help from an editorial assistant. I think became a driver for us. Charlie, you know you're describing um, a lot of uh, time-consuming things. Also, some things that are mundane. You know, you're driving all day. You're looking at databases. Um, is there any point at this point where you think um, this? Is, I, I may just be wasting my time here. Or at this, do you realize at this point we've got something and it's worth slogging on? Not at that point. Well, I mean, no, we, we did do some tests in the very beginning. So we took, we, John took all the data and, and said, well, let's figure out the, the most heavily traveled toll roads. And, and so we, we started with a few down in Miami that were, you know, that, that seemed to be really popular. Um, and we measured the distances, and then we plugged that in to see the speeds. And we got some really high readings. And that's what kind of, we, we figured, okay, there's something here. We got to keep going. So um, let's let's go to the uh, the, the spreadsheet um, that you ended up with. Uh, this was the go this is the mileage raw data. spreadsheet. Just, this is a this is our mileage spreadsheet. We called it our master mileage spreadsheet, and you can just see the point where the person started and when they ended, and uh, how many records are we knew it was well traveled, and then the distance. And we have how we confirm this, and and, and I, we wrote in drove. Some people have asked us, why didn't you just use Google Maps? And we found that Google Maps would be a little off. It tended to be con conservative. It would make the distance a little bit farther than it really was, maybe a tenth of a mile. And, and so for some of the less traveled roads, we did, we did use Google Maps. But we found that's, that's what we found. And, and you know, Google Maps probably want, doesn't want people getting mad at them and saying, oh, hey, it was a tenth of a mile longer. So uh, we, we did a combination of Google Maps. And now when we assemble, assembling this thing was really tricky. People say this probably be easy. But the way the, the raw data came to us and adding in the distance, because the way the thing was built, you'd get all kinds of false readings. Um, you'd get where it would give you a reading from both where the, it would consider one station at one time, the same time it started it being the end station. And then it would give you kind of duplicates that weren't really real. Sort of like a fun house where you have somebody standing in front of a mirror and there's five or six of them, but, uh, and one, only one of them is real. 
So after a lot of work and practicing and checking to make sure things work, this is, this is our final spreadsheet. And um, <clears throat> we actually put this in a database that people could search. We don't have that with us. But you can see over here the, the searchable street. database was, paid, would, was online. Online, yeah. For the yeah, user we, to just Yeah, for the yeah. user. But this is the information that can fed it. And, uh, can fed it. Sorry, fed it. Uh, and you can see there are a lot of high-speed high runs. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, but I consider going, if I'm going 90, I'm really pushing it. Um, all right, so here's the data. Did anybody stand out? Who's the, did anybody stand out as uh, number one on the list? Yes. That, that was the fun part. <laughs> as a matter of fact, of all of our thousands and thousands of uh, actual drivers that we looked at, there was one guy who uh, was the top speeder, or am I doing wrong here again? And it was? Fausto Lopez. Fausto Lopez, the guy in the video. Now, of, <coughs> now, now we he did. He was the top speeder. We didn't know it was him. We had a big long transponder number, but when we did this, one transponder number just rose above everybody, and uh, ultimately we found and out. And we it was did him. know that he lived in Coconut Creek from his famous, uh, you know, traffic stop with the trooper. So we kind of figured it was him based on the route he was going, which was the turnpike up, and then he was getting off of it in the exit right by Coconut Creek. And then we confirmed through a couple of different sources that that transponder did belong to his car. So this is one of my favorite graphics that we put together. This is Fausto Lopez's uh, average speeds as he's going back and forth to work uh, in Miami from Coconut Creek. And he averaged over 100 miles an hour on 114 days uh, the previous year. And then this is great. So here's this first little dot here. That's the date that the trooper pulled him over. So you see after that, he slowed down a little bit, but you know, he's still pushing 90, 95. And then here, this date is when, the, uh, when his story broke, when it went uh, viral, and, and then he, that sort of did it for him. He slowed down. Yeah, the T, uh, I think it was Univision showed the video of the, uh, the uh, trooper's webcam on her car and showed that, and, and it would, I mean, it, this thing went viral, because like, she's yelling at him. He's saying, I didn't know you were there, I didn't see you. He said, you didn't see flashing blue lights, you know, for four miles or whatever, in the dark. And, and, and they had some, he, she, she was, had some pretty mean words. Appropriate, angry words, I should say. <laughs> say, before we leave that graphic, for, uh, you know, any of, the, any of the journalism students here uh, today, uh, we've talked about databases, and I think this is a great example of how to use data, but I think this is uh, a great example of how to use graphics. It's not just looking pretty. Uh, if you Don't read this graphic, and it takes a, takes a couple minutes, um, it tells the story. It's irrefutable. And, uh, and that's a good graphic. And one thing I, I should, you know, if you do do this, one thing I, I started was I said, let's go how, see how this guy, how many, how fast he, let's make a bar chart. You know, this is made in Excel originally, not this final version, the graphic artist did it. But in Excel, say, let's go see how, how fast he went on average each month. And I uh, did that and it looked pretty cool. And, and then I said, well, you know, how about each week? Well, that was a little bit even better. And I said, well, why not try every day? And that's what you see there. And you can even see his days off where the white lines go all the way to the bottom. By the way, all right, so we mentioned Fausto Lopez in the course of this conversation, but it brings up another point. We named names, correct, of all the cops or all the cops that were relevant, right? No holding back? Right. We, we, uh, we made a decision not to try to identify every, you know, which transponder belonged to every single cop because uh, we f that would delay us too long. So we we've identified the key ones. Uh, here and, and, and in subsequent stories when the police departments did their own investigations and ended up disciplining people, uh, we named all the cops uh, that had been disciplined and that we had found speeding. Yes, we did. Okay, so we have the database. <laughs> You've got irrefutable proof. You've got a great graphic. Um, what's the next step? Sally? So 
you know, we knew we had a big story here. We had, you know, these cops that were uh, clearly speeding recklessly um, and, and excessively. I mean, you know, again, we're talking 90, 100, 110, um, and, and we wanted to show, well, what, you know, the seriousness, we wanted to show the impact. Well, what's, what's been the result of all of this speeding? Uh, so we started looking to, you know, show the human impact, and uh, we had crash data from uh, the state that John uh, and his team would gather each year. So we had, um, I think, about five years worth, so we got another couple of years. So John started working on that and, uh, and his colleague kind of sorting through the data to find uh, how, many, how many cops had, uh, were cited for or where speeding was, was considered a factor, a contributing factor, or the cause of the crash. So they started looking at the data, and I just started doing Google searches, Nexus searches, uh, looking for, oh, it's not that yet, um, you know, what the victims uh, of these speeding cops, and, and started coming across some very compelling uh, cases. This was the one that Howard mentioned early, the 14-year-old girl who was had been at the beach all day with her friend and her uh, stepsister, and w they were just coming back from McDonald's, and this BSO deputy was coming the opposite way, going 90 miles an hour on a, a street with a 45-mile-an-hour speed limit, and he was going to assist another deputy. The call was uh, a tag light that was burned out, so the back of a license plate didn't have the light. and. Uh, they turned in and that's what was left of the car. Kara was in the back seat there. And that then- brings it, That brings it all home. This Excellent. is the, uh, the college student that we mentioned who, he was home for Thanksgiving up in Central Florida. He actually went to school down here. I think it was Miami-Dade College. And he was on break and he was sitting in a traffic light with his friend. Um, they were just sitting there waiting for the light to change. And this cop who had this history of speeding and had never been disciplined for it, uh, just comes flying by, no lights. He wasn't on an, a call at all and he was going 104 miles an hour and he smashed into the back uh, of their car. And that's him now, he requires 24 hour care. So these stories really, I think, you know, helped kind of drive home how serious and dangerous this problem was. All right, so we, we the data is there, um, the case is made, but you know, there's a, there's a question here that isn't just based on data. Um, how is this allowed to happen? I mean, this didn't happen once, this didn't happen in a bad month. This had happened over a very, very long period of time. How is it possible? Yeah, that was the question we wanted to answer, and and you know we we knew kind of generally speaking that it was it, it was a culture a culture within law enforcement that condoned this. Um, you know when we talked to the police chiefs, we we took all of our results to them. Uh, you know they they were not shocked. They they all know that speeding is a problem, uh, but they just hadn't taken it seriously. And uh, so what we wanted to do is kind of demonstrate and show that culture that, that had allowed this to occur. Um, so we had the, the crash data and we wanted to look at, well, you know, when they do cause crashes because they're speeding, what happens to them? Um, and the answer is, you know, not much. Here's, a, here's the difference between police office who was, uh, officers involved in speeding crashes who were issued citations versus civilians in the same situation. So, uh, you know, hardly ever got cited. And then we asked for internal affairs reports because people would call. I mean, you know, they would see somebody and they'd call and report and give them a license plate number and say, this cop was going 95 miles an hour. And, you know, and they would do in investigations and sometimes they would pull the GPS data and they'd go, oh yeah, the guy, you know, our cop was going 100. Um, but, you know, the person who called it in, we really can't be sure our cop was the driver at that time, so unfounded. Uh, or they would, they'd say, okay, yeah, you, you did speed, you know, 110 miles an hour three times last week. Um, we're going to take your take-home car away for a week. And that would be the punishment. So slap on the wrist within the police agencies um, and just this 
professional courtesy that was extended by all the cops. I mean, FHP had an unwritten rule, you don't pull over a, a marked police officer. So, you know, they'd set up stings. I talked to uh, retired uh, troopers who would tell me about, you know, we'd, be ha we'd have a plane up in the air and we'd have guys on the ground and we'd see somebody coming through at 100 miles an hour and our guy on the ground would go, nope, it's a cop, and they don't even stop him. So that was the culture, and, and that's really what had allowed this to get so out of hand. Let's, uh, let, let, me, um, let me ask if we can show the audience here uh, how we presented uh, the result of all this reporting and all the databases and all the graphics. Uh, this is the print. Uh, so it was a three-day series uh, in print. This is uh, uh, first day, which was a Sunday. We'll always publish our biggest stories on Sunday. We have the most readership. Every newspaper does. Pretty good. They do. All right. Um, let's talk about how we decided to present the data. So, you know, we didn't we didn't include in our databases cops who were driving at 60 miles an hour, or 65 miles an hour, which is not not legal. But we didn't do, we didn't include them. Um, in the database. Yes. Uh, yes, we did. And uh, I thought we cut it off at 90. For the story. For the, for the story. story. Now, and, and in fact, you asked me about this, Howard, uh, when we were putting this together. You said, and I started at, at speeds for the database over 65 and up. And you said, and we'd pick 90 sort of as an arbitrary. We, that was our pick of somebody who was really hauling. And, and, and it was, no, no, because it basically we felt that, that everybody would agree that's fast. But Howard said, you know, why are you starting to get 65 for the database? And I said, to be fair to the cop, suppose there were like three times that he went over, uh, you know, 80, and the rest of the time he was driving 65. You know, and there's, there it is. There's yeah. a difference. I, I described John before not just as a database analyst, but as a journalist, and that's how a journalist thinks. It's not just, uh, it's not just the raw numbers. So let's talk about. Let's look at the, um, the uh, other two parts of the series, the ones that ran on Monday and Tuesday, and, and the series was was uh, structured. Uh, oh, with specific on. themes on each day. Uh, uh, the second day was yeah. uh, ruined oh, lives. Yeah. Let's click that up. There we go. And then the third day, uh, which was a Tuesday, looked at um, uh, why. We call it why because we can. That's a three-day series. So um, series runs, it's online. Um, what happens? What's the reaction from the public, from the readers? I so, got, I'll ask Sally. My phone was ringing off the hook. I got hundreds of emails. I've never had a response uh, like that one to any story in 30 years. And I think it's just because it, it touched such a nerve. Everybody could relate to it, number one. Uh, everybody had seen it and themselves and, and and most of it was like you know hey way to go Sun Sentinel thank you for finally bringing this out uh, so really the you know we and we got very little blowback from police which I was I, I was surprised at um, you know a few kind of nasty emails and and they have this uh, they have this website called Leo Affairs so they were talking about it there but you know, they really didn't. They really didn't come after us, which I kind of expected they would. And and the the amazing thing was, not a single police officer or police agency disputed the numbers. Not one. Um, in fact, they all they all opened internal affairs investigations, and they went back and and tried to recreate what we did to see if it was right. Um, and in fact, they even sent Miami police and, and FHP sent. Uh, uniform guys to the newsroom to sit down with us and so we could tell them exactly how we did it uh, because they wanted to learn uh, the methodology but they all verified uh, what we found they didn't do they didn't recreate everything they took samples and they verified it and they disciplined people in the end we ended up with uh, over 165 cops that were disciplined as a result of this uh, and Fausto Lopez um, he would have kept his job, uh, but they, when they went back and verified all of our SunPass readings, uh, he was fired. We even had a couple of people who submitted their own videos. So it was user-generated content 
uh, takes hold in a story like this, which I gotta tell you, surprised me because uh, this is not the kind of thing users, users would usually uh, contribute. Let's take a look at that. That's over 80, if you can't see it, it's going to not, pro, approaching 90. This is a Sunny Isles police officer he's following. And eventually he catches up and, and films from the side so you can see the uh, Sunny Isles Police Department logo on the side. That's good. I thought it was cool that, that just your average reader uh, <laughs> wanted to have his or her say. Great. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, then we'll go to, then we'll go to questions from the audience. Um, so the series was published uh, over three days in February, published in all platforms three days in February. Um, but significantly, you want stories of this magnitude to have result. I know the Pulitzer people look for that, especially in the gold medal. They don't want things to just be hypothetical. Uh, they reward work that moves the needle. And I, uh, Pulitzers aside, uh, we would want that too. So I know that we went back and revisited the databases at the very end of the year. Tell us, or tell everybody what that found. We scrambled to get this data before the end of the year. It took a little while to get it, and we really wanted to publish uh, before the end of the year. And so we put it all together, and actually Sally wrote this last story on vacation. But uh, what we found was what we wanted to find. Scroll down there. You can see that the small type there says 84% uh, drop. Uh, that is work well done. That's making the roads safer for uh, our neighbors. Uh, you can't ask for more than that. So uh, let's, that's a great place to end it. Let's uh, take questions from anybody in the audience.